so much to, to Liz and, uh, and everyone here. Um, it's kind of a nice circle, as Liz was saying. Um, when this uh, facility first opened up, Liz was very interested in bringing my mug here. I was able to help out a little bit, um, be around on, on Tuesday nights before my shift finishes. Usually I'm at the other end actually teaching about 3D printing on Tuesday nights. Um, and then uh, we had this conversation about actually presenting kind of the potential of 3D printing and all the rest of it. I've um, never been introduced before uh, by having my roommate mentioned, which is my Dalek, but uh, in a lot of ways it does play into what we're going to talk about today because with my background, as, as Les mentioned about before, about filmmaking, um, when you are an independent, and before I was able to go over and actually work with the big boys in Hollywood, um, whatever you can pull off, you have to pull off on your own resources. And you can imagine that something like 3D printing, or Arduino technology, or all these different things people are now playing with that is able to take what you can make in your garage or in your home to the next level, were things that I was really interested in. And naturally, I was interested in anything that had anything really to do with up and coming technology. Um, on a personal level, I got my first Mac, uh, I think it was 94, it was the Quicksilver uh, OS 10. I have a disk that says version OS 10, and the next one says 10.1, 10.2, 10.3. That's how far back, back I went. And I was so terrified of the system, I emulated Windows for the first six months. I was like, I wasn't too sure exactly what was going on, but. Um, I fell in love with, with Apple because with the background in PCs, I didn't have to struggle with the software. I could actually concentrate on being creative. Um, so I, I live now in, a, in, a, in an Apple world. I have an iPhone, I, whatever you want to call it. I guess that's the iPad or all the rest of it. Um, and you'll see that the 3D printer here that's actually running is running off a, an iMac, uh, uh, iMac Pro. So you know, there's a lot of ideas that PCs only have enough power to generate these sort of results. Um, I like speaking to an audience that knows that's, that's garbage. Like Apple is, is there, and I, you know, uh, a lot of people, you know, said to me when I first got my machine, it cost me seven thousand dollars for a Quicksilver box back in the day because they, that's what they cost. And people went, you could buy a car or a computer. Why? You've got three PCs. Why do you want to buy a Mac? And I was like. I, uh, my university project was actually to, to edit, finish editing the film, and they had the first version of Final Cut Pro on it. And I was able to actually get that film done. So, you know, if anyone's interested, I'm more than happy to talk about after the presentation. Um, that journey actually led me to, uh, to the US, to, to California, and I actually got to work on a thing called Cinema Tools, which was later co opted into Final Cut Pro that allowed people uh, who were film, shooting on film to actually frame edge their edits and be able to send it off and actually finish their film on film after editing on a non-linear edit suite. So it's, there's a lot of stuff going on and years uh, ago, Les and I were able to talk at, uh, at Macworld, which was really nice. There was a nice blend of all of that. So that brings me all here. We're only going to talk about 3D printing today. I thought I'd just give you guys a little bit of a back, background and think that I'm not one of you guys. I, I am, totally. <laughs> it makes it a little easier for me to stand up here when you guys understand that. Um, one of the things that I was going to do today is um, because there's a lot of you out here, and I'm sure you've all got iPhones and probably Twitter accounts. If you've got any questions or anything that comes up during the presentation, that's my Twitter handle. Feel free to uh, send the messages across, and uh, as they come up, I'll try to answer them. It kind of makes things a little easier. Um, you can see my handle there, the coach of Tony Stark, is a nickname that my friends keep calling me for the last few years, and I just gave up and just adopted it. So. You'll see that come up a little bit. 3D printing, what's it all about? Why is, does everyone get kind of excited about all this sort of stuff? It really comes down to one thing, it's called additive manufacturing. Traditionally, if you guys wanted to build something, you'd probably have to go down to Bunnings, buy some material, depending on what size it is, pull out a power saw, a hand saw, a drill, and start removing material. And that's how mankind builds things. And that's exactly what we've done for, for literally thousands of years. 3D printing is the opposite of that. And it's the first time we've really seen it, which is we add material as we need. So you can imagine, um, traditionally, you know, when you want to build something, you've got to remove all the material. The best example that I know of is Michelangelo. It's a very famous piece of, of artwork that he created, the angel out of marble. Someone once asked him, you know, how, how could you create something like that? And he was quoted to say that he saw the angel inside the marble and carved to let him, to set him free. And I mean, that's it. That's how we know how to create and make things. Take it to the next stage of industrial development. 
and we've got things like called, called lathes and mills. Just out of curiosity, anyone here ever played with a mill or a lathe? Right. Ironically, being a technical film guy, when I was a teenager, I always wanted to duck this for lasers. If you've ever bought a SLR camera or a high-end camera, those adapters can cost more than the actual camera itself. And I didn't have thousands of dollars, but I had a friend whose father was a shop fitter. And he had a lathe and a mill in his garage, that's how he made his living. And I would pester him all the time to show me how to do these sort of things because I wanted to make them myself. Little did I know that years later I'd be using these examples uh, in teaching the difference between subtractive and additive manufacturing. Give it one second while I do more uh, announcements. I'm going to lock us in. I guess you guys are used to it every year, every month, right? They get those announcements. So with a lathe, it basically it's a, the industrial way of removing a lot of material from a very, some very strong materials, such as uh, steel. And if you've ever seen this, it's basically a, p a piece of material that's spun very quickly. You take a harder material, you rub it up against it, it peels it away. And again, this is, you know, when you look around at uh, cars, at uh, planes, at uh, buildings, this is how they were able to make pieces that were fit together. This is uh, the ability to, to create things like the combustion engine, this really took us, once we were able to get this, uh, these techniques down pat, it took us really to the next level. It's pretty amazing. But the big issues with that is whatever material you, you remove, you've really lost it. And if you make a mistake, if you take too much, that material is put aside and you have to start all over again. So you can imagine why people would have careers in being able to be experts at removing material from this sort of stuff. Very different again to, to, to 3D printing. And of course, World War II really kind of changed that whole, the whole face of the, uh, of the world when it came to manufacturing. The US really came in there. They were able to do a, a lot of tooling up um, for, for, the, for women's liberation. I really believe that's where it began, where all the men went off to fight, and the women were in these factories learning how to use these, these uh, tools and, and making the infrastructure for. The, uh, the armies that went up when they went over there. It was a pretty in interesting time. I always wondered what happened when the soldiers came back and found their wives, you know, in factories turning parts for, for cars. And that's really also um, created a huge, huge manufacturing base for, for the US that went on to, to be able to take those skills and really push it right out there. The next really big, big change when it comes to manufacturing is a thing called plastic inject molding. And that builds on the, the skill we just spoke about in the idea of these tool fitters, these uh, shop fitters, these tur fitters and turners were able to take their skill and make metal molds of what they were actually uh, going to make. You can see in the example here, you've got a chest piece. Um, and what they've done is they've carved out the negative of that chest piece. It goes into a machine. And that machine then runs 24 hours a day spitting uh, high pressure uh, plastic into the mold. Pops it open, ejects it, closes itself up, and, and runs again. And that's really the world that I grew up in. And in fact, everyone sitting on these chairs are all uh, plastic inject molded. Our whole world, everything that's disposable, everything from our cars to our toothpaste lids and toothpaste containers, are all created this way. But once you've made that mold, you can't really change it. It's a very fast way to, to manufacture something, but if there's a design flaw in it, you're going to go back to scratch. You've got to start literally um, from scratch is what I was trying to say. Um, it's a, it's a, if you're going to change something, you need to do it in a design phase. I had a TV, a big wall, um, big flat screen TV that someone had designed. They put the uh, power regulator with no airflow. Guess what happened after six months? Anyone want to take a guess? It didn't catch on fire. Thank goodness, but it blew. There was no airflow, heat, as we all know. It's a real problem when it comes to changing the uh, voltages. I uh, went back to JB Hi-Fi. They replaced it. Guess what happened six months later? Happened again. Now, being a maker, being someone who understands processes and, and all the rest of it, when I got the third one, I realized two things. One was I probably had another six months before they would replace it one more time. And if it failed that time, I would have lost my TV altogether. And the second thing that I realized was there was a problem that needed to be solved. So I did the simplest thing that I could. I went to an old computer, took out a fan, cut into the plastic back, which was inject molded, put the fan in. That TV works flawlessly till today. 
But the really interesting thing for me and why I'm telling this story is about a year later, I went into JB Hi-Fi to pick up some CDs, and the guy who I dealt with, who I became kind of friendly with, said, hey, the new model of the TV just came in. I said, oh, okay, well, my, my, my TV's fixed, I fixed it. He was not going to take a look at the back. And as he turned the, the back around, they had actually created slots where this uh, power pack was to let airflow go through. And I was like, wow, okay. And he goes, yeah, they're waiting the next month to fix it. So this was obviously a real big problem with these TVs, but it was cheaper for them to just keep giving the TVs, replacing them, than it was to change the whole run. So that's a really interesting part. It's not, um, the fact when it comes to this sort of kind of plastic inject molding process that if you want to make these things you can make hundreds, thousands, million pieces but once they're all made you're kind of stuck with what goes on. There's only really three industries that I know of that will instantly deal with an issue. Um, one would be the automotive industry. We will see recalls on, on anything to do with safety, brakes, seat belts, food is the other one. Like, you know, we had that, that uh, would have been like 15 years ago, Garibaldi, pull all of it off. You know, anything like that you see in the news straight away. And I think medication is the other one. These three things. Uh, any, any other manufacturing, um, they'll wait until the next generation to deal with, with an issue, if they're ever going to deal with it. And that's because they use this sort, of, um, this sort of stuff. It's interesting. I just realized that my Mac's going to turn off. <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to get some power. The next part, an example of some of the things that you can see that are plastic inject molded. This is a peat bottle. You can see how delicate and intricate some of the designs are right here. You can see the metal, the middle core that actually goes in the middle to create the hollow, and basically plastic at a very high temperature and a lot of uh, pressure gets pushed all the way through. So that's a good example. Excuse me, one second. I'm just going to grab. If you can go into my backpack, but in the main one there's my. Um, I charge. I didn't. The one thing I did do today, um, setting up the printer, I didn't. I completely forgot to put my power on. Just while we take this quick break and I get some power, the 3D printer right now is actually working throughout our presentation. Um, and why it does that is the drawback to having the flexibility that a 3D printer has is that it takes a bit of time to build the actual object. And you'll see as this goes on, the the actual uh, object will grow over time. So let me just, beautiful. Thank you so much, Liz. <laughs> Very, last time I was up here was actually for TEDx. So you can imagine what they would have said to me if I forgot my power on that presentation. I don't think they would have uh, invited me back. Okay, that's much better. So really the, the, the three um, kind of manufacturing rules when it comes to 3D printing, um, just to give you a, a, an example of why people are so excited about this technology, is that you know, you've got loads and loads that usually remove large uh, amounts of material. Uh, plus the inject molding came from that, so that's the next step, the natural step, to create um, ob objects using plastic. Uh, 3D printing as material only into the areas that you need. So again, you're, you, you're not losing, you're not wasting a lot of material, and you've got a lot of flexibility. If one print comes out and you've got to change, uh, it doesn't work in your prototype or something changes, you can actually go back to that digital master, change it, and print it again, which gives you a lot of incredible flexibility. Um, and versatility, that's exactly it. It's a repeatable process. You can keep doing it over and over again without a lot of costly overheads. To, for a plastic inject mold, um, machine, you're looking at like hundreds of thousands of dollars. The actual dyes themselves can cost almost the same amount, depending on the ha um, the versatility of that and who makes it. Like you, again, you want to pay top dollars, so make sure someone can do it the first time instead of costing you money every time. So 3D printers, like what's this all about? How does it make these things? How does it actually work that you've got this versatility and you've got a machine that can sit on a desk that could make pretty much almost anything? So the printers we have at the library and most hobby-based printers, the printers you'll find at home, use a thing called fused filament fabrication. And you can see in this, this diagram, um, number one, the, the kind of red uh, piece at the top is the extruder. And what it actually does is it fill, feeds in plastic filament. So it's, think of it as whippersnapper cable. Uh, very thin. It's a continuous feed. It's controlled by the computer. And then it comes out of a nozzle. Um, a good analogy for this is like a computer-controlled hot glue gun. So if you pull the trigger on a hot glue gun, lots of glue comes straight out. If you 
uh, pull it very gently, a small amount comes out. It's basically the same process, but instead of it being a liquid like the glue is, it's actually at a temperature which makes it malleable, but it's not a, a liquid, in liquid form, so it holds its shape. It actually spits this out onto a table, a, a flat surface, and as these strands start to cool off, they bond and fuse. So that's the, basically, in a nutshell, the theory of a 3D printer and the way it actually works for these fused filament fabrication machines. Now, there are different types of uh, formats when it comes to 3D printers. And of course, these are the cheapest and the most accessible machines. And I actually believe the safest. Um, I think that's why exactly why they're in a home market. You can have machines that use a laser to actually heat up and fuse titanium flakes which you can imagine, we, the light we hear is a wooden building, so if you were able to do that sort of stuff here, we'd actually probably be on fire, <laughs> that, that amount of heat being generated. There are other machines that fire a laser into, um, like a, it's almost like a fiberglass resin, and heat up certain areas, so SLA printing, um, that's very popular, but it gets very expensive, the materials to use that, uh, I think the domestic machine is about $500 for half a litre of material, where here, um, the material for a kilo, you're looking at about $30, so it makes it a lot more accessible. I've, I've seen one where it's a, a batch of, like a photocopier, a batch of tubes, and they takes one layer of towel. And it injects resin into it, but it means you can build um, voids. Sure. So, so they falls inside, falls inside, they usually made a bi-green, so it make one of those. Sure. And once you shake out all the uncured talcum powder, the whole thing just worked. That's right. Those, those machines um, take a lot of time. Uh, but the results are amazing, and again, that, that material, some of those materials are reusable as well, which is great. Um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to being able to get a hold of one of those machines here, but it's going to take some time. They they consider more the prosumer uh, level of machines, but you're right. They, and again, there's certain questions on how they do it. Sometimes they queue with uh, UV light, which is an issue if you're going to take it out into daylight because the UV will break it down. Um, some people, sometimes they use resins, uh, they eject resins. I've seen one, some that use like ink cartridges, just like a inkjet printer and will actually color parts of it at the same time. I and mean, this is definitely the future of, uh, of 3D printing. It's all about delivery systems, and that's what people are exploring right now. I've actually seen a machine that uses paper. Use the same paper you write for sheets that you use uh, in, a, in a normal photocopy machine. It'll take the, the, the paper, move it down, will actually glue the areas that are needed, and it'll also score and cut them. So it's one layer on top of just using paper. I believe that Staples in America will uh, have these machines, and you can take your designs and they'll, they'll create them in, with paper. And again, color it and all the rest of it, so it's kind of really neat. Um, I thought I'd give you a close-up uh, example of a 3D printer in action. This is a printer I have at home. Um, I didn't bore you with the whole 58 minutes worth of 3D printing, but basically, it's essentially what you'll see here is exactly what's going on over there in the 3D printer. Um, out of the plan, I'll narrate it. Um, basically, what's doing here is it's actually spitting out a 0.3 mil layer of material onto a bed, a flat bed, um, and it's actually created a whistle. A workable whistle. Um, and at this point, you can see the initial stuff that it's laid down is what's called a raft, just to hold it onto the surface, give it a lot of surface tension so it doesn't move. But what it's doing right now is it's, it's, um, sitting, it's actually filling in that first layer of the whistle. And now it's going to go on to the second one. You'll see that it'll actually start uh, bringing material in the opposite way. So you've got kind of a crisscross so that uh, you've got strength in, in the actual design. This will jump around a little bit for you, but I'll, I'll let you know what's going on. Uh, I consider these machines to be the ultimate tracers because that's exactly what they do. They keep tracing their design one very small layer at a time to create a 3D uh, layer. Uh, at this point, it's actually now just working on the outside uh, walls of the whistle. And uh, you may be able to see here that um, on the back wall, it's starting to build the area where, the, where someone's breath escapes. And you'll see here, it's starting in the middle, this is actually the ball that, that's going to actually make the sound of the whistle. Um, and what I love about this design is, and you'll see as it starts putting material in, there's just enough material in there to hold, hold it there to build the ball. But once it's all gone hard, all you've got to do is shake to break the ball, and then you've actually got to work on the whistle. 
and uh, I didn't finish. <laughs> and you, I don't think you want to see it just filling in the top because that's really uh, kind of boring. But this was a, a workable whistle that after 45 minutes, 49 minutes to print out, I could give to, to anyone, I could give it to my nephew, and he could just blow the whistle and it's an actual functional product. So it's kind of really neat when you think about something, okay, maybe you'll, you'll uh, buy one for you know, three, five dollars in the store, but if you if the store is closed and you really need this, you've got access to be able to, to, to create something that's actually functional, which is really neat. Um, just a little bit on the history of 3D printing, so where does it all come from? Um, it all came from a guy called Charles Hull, who was a, a PhD student. Um, and he came up with this idea of stereolithography, the idea of creating something um, in stereo that would be able to, to uh, create. I love, you probably guys probably can't see it, but it says, this is the article talking about his success. Revolutionary, a machine makes 3D objects from drawings, and, and below it, it says, uh, show us some 3D plastic models made uh, by the selective laser centering device. Like, the language in this is, there is no language. No one really kind of understands what's going on here because it's just not in the vernacular to discuss what's going on. Surprisingly enough, um, Charles Howe was in Europe and I happened to recognize him on the street and ran up to him and said, are you Charles Howe? And he went, who the hell are you? <laughs> I said, I talk about you all. <laughs> it was twice a month in, in Melbourne, Australia, and he said, very nice, get away from me. Uh, but we were able to swap, uh, swap business cards, um, and I was able to ask him some questions, and I asked him, do you have any photos of the you know, first 3D printer ever device? And um, he sent me these, which is kind of really neat. Um, the top left photo is the world's first 3D printer. I love that idea, because there's a Commodore 64 sitting there on a desk. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not too fancy. Um, what looks like a, a paper printer uh, on the right-hand side is a laser tube and uh, basically a motorized uh, bed that would move it around. And uh, again, I asked him a few questions. He used a derivative of fiberglass resin. I don't know if anyone's ever done fiberglass work before, but it really, really smells bad, and it gets everywhere. So I know that when I am was um, researching into and discovering 3D printing, uh, some people would come into my place and go, oh, it smells, and I'm like, it smells about better than it could be. You know, it's like this stuff would have been horrible. And in the bottom is actually the world's first 3D printed result, which was a square with a circle and a whole bunch of circles as if you drilled a pattern into it. And they were able to, to do that and actually prove this theory. Um, Charles went on to, uh, well, and the university went on to patent this, develop it, and they, in, in the 80s, they were able to market it to large uh, companies that were interested in prototyping and automating that. So Westinghouse and General Electric and General Motors and all these companies that had hired lots of patent makers and all the rest of it to, to, to develop stuff, they developed this technology, and that's really where it stayed for a very long time. It was all big business, um, it was processes, it was consumables, it fed you through until about 2005, where Adrian Bauer um, developed a thing called the Rep Wrap Project. And this is where the talk of like 3D printers being able to create their own 3D printers comes out. And it's kind of a very really interesting thing. Adrian Bauer knew about this process, and around 2001, 2002, China decided they would get into the electronics game. And when they did, they brought the prices down on components to a reasonable uh, price that people could start experimenting on. Um, one of the main things that these 3D printers needed was a registrable motor device so that you could basically uh, repeat movements. And they use a thing called stepper motors. And back in the early days, those stepper motors were really expensive. And one would cost you about $400. Now you could go online and actually buy all five um, motors you'd need for a printer for about 90 So you can imagine, um, when, when uh, Adrian kind of realized that you can now make a 3D printer using the things out of bunnings, basically, rods, bolts, um, materials, and he decided that he was going to create his own 3D printer and be able to share that information. And again, 2000, 2005, very interesting time for the internet, um, especially after the whole shareware, freeware has come out. People started taking that idea and there were structures now put in place for people to share ideas that didn't necessarily take a monetary uh, value. And again, this is the time where people started coming together and creating things like the Creative Commons. So you could share things online and still have some sort of protection. And 
And really, one of the big projects that came out of it was the Repo project, where people were designing stuff and being able to share it, and not so much protecting their ideas, but sharing that knowledge, and then still being able to, to have some sort of uh, recognition for what they were able to, to bring in. So Alien comes and designs the first machine. All the parts that needed to be 3D printed, he actually goes off to a 3D printing company and gets those parts made. And then the minute he got that machine working, the first thing he printed was other parts from another machine. So those selected pieces that were needed, and that's why he's standing there with a, with a sign saying parent, and, uh, his, his, and then someone else is standing there with his uh, sign saying child, because the parent machine printed all the uh, necessary parts that you couldn't get off the shelf for the child. And, and again, this was like the media picked up on this and said, three printers are making themselves. The robots are coming. They're going to kill us all. It's the Terminator or whatever. They're going to replicate each other and just they'll be no one for the humans. Um, that's where this idea came from. Um, a big part, again, of the Repro project, um, this project exists today. You can go to repro.org and you can start downloading ideas, patterns, parts that work. Back in 2005, you had to be pretty handy to be able to make one of these machines. The electronics boards, controllers, all that sort of stuff didn't exist. So people had to be uh, able to make PC boards and troubleshoot electronics and be able to put these things together. It was a very uphill battle to get these machines to work. And you know, a lot of people dropped off. And some of these guys came along. And um, these three guys were in a makerspace. They decided they wanted to, to uh, create some really kind of cool robots for a TV show called Robot Wars. Uh, if anyone knows about that, that's where you build these kind of funky destroying robots and you put them into a battle place and, the, and you basically try to destroy someone else's robot. And if you survive, you go on to the next level. It's, it's geek heaven, basically. Like, if you don't like to build stuff and destroy stuff, this is the game for you. Um, when they were creating some parts, they realized that a 3D printer would work out really well, and they had seen the Repro project, and they basically went to a makerspace and worked on this, and they were able to create a thing called a cupcake CNC. So again, the language still isn't there, there's no such thing as a 3D printer. CNC because it's a computer controlled design, device. Cupcake because it printed something the size of a cupcake. That was a print area. The same thing, you put a cupcake down, that's, you, you have that area to be able to create something. Um, Ironically, when they got that machine working, the, uh, the, the television station that was running this uh, TV show canceled the show. They weren't too sure exactly what was going on. But uh, what they did find was a, there was a lot of people who wanted to get into the 3D printing game and explore it, but didn't have the necessary skills to go from scratch with the Repro project. So they approached them to make kits. And they were really successful with it. And what they were able to do was a number of really kind of cool things. One was create an online community that were all building these 3D printers from the same kits and were able to, to share resources that way. You were able to get all the stuff you needed um, in, in, in a kit. You didn't have to go source the things out. And they, these cupcake CNC machines became really, really popular, so much so that they formed a company and they came out with a Thinematic, which is the machine, probably the most popular machine uh, as a kit on the right-hand side. I'm lucky enough to say that I have one of these machines at home. After a few years of looking around, I had someone who was giving up theirs a few years ago. They're pretty amazing kits because they're all made through CNC processes. So the outside uh, box is actually laser cut, and um, the, it comes with 3D printed parts for, the, for those unique things, and they're pretty robust. These kits went around the world. There's a, probably about 600 of these machines in Australia alone, because it allowed people to come, come together and actually be able to create and research. They became very, very successful. Um, they, then their next main printer was an out-of-the-box printer, um, and they realized very quickly that if you had a machine that you didn't know how to design something or create something, can you imagine going home and saying, hi, honey, I just bought a 3D printer. Great, what's it do? Don't know. Why do you spend six thousand dollars on a machine that doesn't know what to do? So what they ended up doing was creating an online site, a repository of designs that people could download called Thingiverse. So if you are learning and it's going to take you a bit of time to actually understand how to design things and get great results, you can actually go there and download uh, uh, objects. And this was a really kind of again created a very amazing com uh, online community. So much so that all of this stuff, all the MakerBot stuff, was uh, open source. So people were developing, trying things, they would put those designs up on Thingiverse, and people would actually start using the, the new iterations for, for um, motor housings and extruders, and this was really great. And they, like, 
I don't know many companies that gets the user base to do all the R&D research for them, but it, that's naturally what happened. Incredible. And the company went on really to become great. Let's go back one step to Charles Hull, and he started a company called Stratasyst, which became the leader when it came to uh, industry level 3D thinking. They never saw uh, the possibility of a home market. So what does one big company do when he wants to, uh, to enter the market? They bought out MakerBot. It was a great sale. But at the same time, they, they wanted to make it a more commercial product, so they closed sourced it, which they uh, a lot of uh, the user base. And um, the machine you have seen here is one of the fifth generation Megabot machines. Um, I personally, I can see the difference between having an R&D like, uh, market of users. Um, you can't really get in and tinker with these machines at all. I understand exactly what they did because they based it on their commercial market, but um, as time has shown over the last couple of years, they've lost a lot of the market share, unfortunately, which, which kind of happens. Um, from this success, a lot of uh, options, a lot of uh, companies started up creating 3D printers, and that's why you can walk into Harvey Norman or Officeworks and actually buy a 3D printer off the shelf today, which again is, is kind of phenomenal. It's a little bit uh, like the accidental empires of the computer industry. If you think about how Apple started with uh, Wise and Steve Jobs making circuit boards for the Apple II computer, it, it, it's, the parallel is, is, is scary with this sort of stuff. It's pretty amazing. I um, want to walk, walk through the workflow really, really quickly because everyone says to me, this is great information, well, this would have to design something, I've got an idea, I want to create it. If I buy one of these machines, what am I going to do? Um, this is a 3D printed ring, just as an example of stuff. But uh, the first step is to design, and to design something, you use uh, a CAD program. Some of the uh, CAD programs that we use in the library, uh, like SketchUp, Google SketchUp, that uh, everyone, uh, people are nodding their head. Interesting about Google SketchUp, I've never known Google to get rid of a product once they buy it. Anyone who actually use SketchUp? Right, so Trimble now owns it. Another company apart from Google, I would love to know the story, and maybe if you know you can tell me, as to why Google absorbed a product, developed it for their, their Google Maps option uh, software, which was originally Google Earth, and they got rid of it. It's a very interesting question. Maybe maybe someone uh, watching this can knows the answer, or maybe someone here knows. I think it's really kind of interesting because it has a huge uh, user base. So, so you can print from a SketchUp file? You, yes, you can. Yes, you can. There's a few steps you need involved into being able to do that, but you can. Um, it's a little clunky. I actually like to use software that is actually designed for 3D printing because it cleans up a lot of things. SketchUp has, was really designed as a uh, simulation software for architects. That's why we see the, the wonderful house that's, that's built here. Um, when it comes to actually building a physical object, um, sometimes if you want to build, let's say, a surface, you can make it one pixel thick in SketchUp and put a, put a texture on it and it looks solid. The 3D printer doesn't understand one pixel, so it'll remove that. I've gone to the immense um, SketchUp library, grabbed a few things, put them on the printer, and I'm really surprised at how many surfaces don't come out. So, you know, there is uh, things you can do with it. Uh, we also use um, a thing called Make123D and Tindercad. Tinkercad. Uh, someone said that to me as a joke, and no one got that. Uh, Tinkercad. Tinkercad is um, a piece of software that was designed for students, uh, for children. Very simple. I, we teach this here at the library. In fact, I use this a lot when it, I create something. It's the first program that I use because it's, and it's, like, it's just fun to create. It's a push and pull, very similar to, to SketchUp, uh, but doesn't have all the bells and whistles. But it's a really, really nice piece of software that allows you to create very, very quickly. And in fact, we have classes here at the library. Within the hour, people are actually creating printable objects within that hour, which is a really great, uh, it's just a great experience to be able to create something and know that you can take it to the printer and print it out if you want. And we have quite a few students that do that. There's immense amounts of, of software now that uh, are compatible with the 3D printer, and some of them are, some are not. So you know, uh, 3D Max is a PC program, but uh, I've never seen a Mac version of 3D Max. So, um, but the, but the, there are a large amount of uh, Mac. Uh, 
compatible software for this sort of stuff. The next, um, once you've got your design, the next thing you need to do is uh, take it to what they call slicing software. So the idea here is since the printer only prints out at like one, between 0.1 and 0.4 uh, mils, you need to kind of like plane, digitally plane your design uh, in a way so the printer knows where to deposit material. And that's, this program does this all automatically. I'm going to be going to make about here. Uh, we've got a, this example here is uh, what they call make about desktop. Um, it's proprietary, as I was saying before, unfortunately. So you have to use this if you use these printers. And what it actually does is it slices up your design um, into G code and sends it to the printer. So. All you need to really do at, at the user's end is take your designs, put it in that gray area, which works out to be the printable area in your printer. Um, once you've got it all laid out, you can hit the N for make, and it sends that print over. One of the really interesting things, though, um, that most people aren't aware of at this level is that the prints are not sold like a plastic inject molded uh, part. Um, to save time and material, the software itself creates a thing called infill. And you are actually able to, uh, to control how much infill is in the, in the printer itself. So these are um, four examples. Um, you've got a linear or a hexagonal. There's a lot of discussions. I've had someone going, I never use hexagonal uh, infill because it ruins your printer. Right? Linear, straight lines, motor runs, one mo motor is running at one time. Lin uh, hexagonal, you've got two motors moving at the same time, and they're worried about burning out those motors. Which I've never heard that uh, argument. I, I must admit, uh, I was in a maker space, so it's only kind of maker geeks who are worried about that. But I've got to be honest with you, I kind of looked at it first myself. I'd rather burn out the motor and spend $20 getting a replacement <laughs> than, uh, than using a linear because, of course, if you've got to break a, a, a parallel to a linear thing, it's, it's going to break uh, all the way through. Um, you've got two other ones. Um, I like the one at the end here. This is really cute because these are little cats. You can see the designs of little cats. Someone's just got a little bit creative with, with, with that. And they've actually, they call it cat film. You can see the cat, the ears, the, and, and the tail. A few years ago, there was a big discussion. If I went and printed out Mickey Mouse, right? Could, uh, well, D Disney, Disney company come and sue me. And there was a whole discussion that if you change something 10%, it's, it's, it's a new product. And the argument was, well, what if I change the info? Right? Um, I don't think anyone would ever challenge it, and I wouldn't challenge Disney because they have a lot of lawyers uh, at their call. But the idea was, if, um, I think, uh, from what I understand, if, if someone came and let's say was going to buy a Mickey Mouse statue, they can't really see the inside of it. Therefore, it's, you're actually selling it with the idea that it's an actual product, and you're basing it on on, on what's going on. But that's a kind of a very interesting, um, you know something to be aware of, if you, you can actually fill a, hot, a 3D print at 100% and it will come out str as strong as a plastic inject molded uh, part. Um, most of the things that are on this table I print at 10% because they're, they're not going to be weight bearing at any time. Um, and if you go over after the talk, pick them up, you'll see how light they are. It also saves a lot of time. So again, that, that's something just to be aware of. And the last part about it is the actual printing itself. So at this point, once you've designed it, once you've put in all the settings, there's not too much else that you need to do. It's really just about going on, you know, sending the printer off and making sure that the, the print doesn't fail, it doesn't move, because the printers aren't smart enough to know that there's a giant in the extruder or the print's moved or it's out of alignment. The very first time I ever printed something big it was 13 hours, and I went to sleep, I woke up, and I, I, it was like a box, and it had shifted, and it looked like someone took the printer and went, uh, and, it, and you know, I have that today in my office to always remind me to, to check what, what, what's going on. It was a very expensive print because I didn't know anything either, so I was like, info, 75%. And it was a lot of material. <laughs> but, uh, you know, alas, you, that's, that's the way you, you learn. Uh, we have a number of printers, we have five different uh, Megabot printers here, which we uh, allow the public to get access to, so when they design something, they can come to one of our uh, printer and maker sessions and actually put uh, the prints on and see what's going on, which is really kind of nice. So, you know, we had a few people here who were like, I was really interested in this, um, but I didn't think I'd ever get a chance to, and it's like, that's great, I'm going go, to go to university now, and I'm going to go like, learn all about it and see what happens and all the rest of it. Um, so that's exactly what... Uh, um, 
but that's the stages of being able to print something, which is kind of neat. So a lot of people ask me the next question, what's, what's a print made out of? Like, what, what do these machines use? Um, well, these uh, domestic printers use uh, plastic filament, as I said, was saying before. It reminds me very much of a snipper cable. I have a friend who's very, very handy, very, very clever, and I challenged him to be able to print with nylon snipper cable that I found in my home. And after a year and a half of tinkering, he actually did that. He was able to control the heat in the muzzle enough, and you, uh, through uh, trial and error, he was able to actually get that nylon to print, um, which was amazing, absolutely amazing. The uh, two most popular filaments at this time are ABS, which is the same stuff they make um, the web bricks out of. If you've ever like walked around, uh, if you've got kids and you walked around your home and you know they've left a, a, a brick out and you stood on it with bare feet, it really hurts. I know that because that happened to me and I decided that I wanted to check the tensile strength of that brick, so I took two pliers and tried to snap it. Didn't happen. Very, very re re resilient material. Will flex a lot before it actually snaps, which is why it's used so well. But it's also a petro petrochemical, which means that when you heat it up, some of the fumes aren't as healthy as, as one would imagine. I had a friend of mine who bought a very small printer and left it in his bedroom. It would print overnight. Um, that way he could hear if there was a problem. And about three months later, he came to me and goes, I don't know what's going on, I've got asthma. I said, well, asthma? Well, okay. Um, and we kept talking, he was talking about his 3D printer. I said, where do you put the printer? He goes, in my bedroom. And I said, why don't you take the printer out of the bedroom and see what happens to your asthma? And about four months later, his asthma disappeared. So you can imagine that's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in an environment that's going to, uh, to allow you to do that sort of stuff, it, it can be a little bit... Uh, dangerous. But what we use in, in the lab is a thing called PLA, which is poly polyacrylic acid, which is um, actually made out of cornstarch, sugars. And the great thing about that is you can heat it up, you can run it in, a, in an enclosed environment like this, um, there's no petrochemical involved. It's all organic. And the idea is that in 30 years time, all those prints will actually biodegrade. So they'll break down. Which I don't know if it's a really good thing, because I spent way too much time designing some of these things. I don't know if I want them to, to, to disappear. Um, PLA has a, a few disadvantages too. It uses, it, uh, uses a lot and less heat. So uh, if you put it into the car, it'll actually melt over time. I had a 3D printer that I put together with some 3D printed parts. And uh, what ended up happening was that um, uh, I left it over Christmas day last year, really hot day. Uh, when I went to go get my printer, I was surprised that, that it had fallen apart. The, uh, the parts in the, print, in the printer actually um, sagged using gravity once it became malleable, and I couldn't use those parts anymore. Luckily, I was able to go and actually um, uh, to, to the person who had designed this printer and get replacement parts, and we were both really, really surprised at what had happened. So it would be much better to have printed them in ABS because they would have been a lot more resilient. Uh, Are they producing new materials? There's a lot of different materials out there. It all comes to, to, to uh, temperature control on the, uh, on the extruder. There are some, uh, I know HIPS, uh, high impact polystyrene has been used. Um, I know, uh, as I say, nylon is coming out on the market. Some very flexible rubbers are also being used um, for these domestic machines. So the people that print jewelry in gold and silver, then, right, so th that's a um, multiple step process. A lot, some jewelry will be used wax, and instead of carving wax and then putting in the lost wax uh, process, they'll get the machine to do that. Um, some people, I know there's a company in America called Shapeways that will print using a different type of printer, one of those powder printers, and they'll plate it with gold or silver. Oh, I see. So you can print the model with wax, okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, these machines won't. They're, they're very specific machines that, that will. So uh, I haven't seen... Um, I actually, the closest I've come to this was I actually wanted to, to make a part out of aluminium. Using PLA, because it had a very low temperature, we were able to put the part, uh, create the part, put it into sand, and then pour hot aluminium, which is a very low temperature, most is about 100 degrees, and it vaporized the, the, the actual part instantly and filled uh, the void with aluminium. So you can do that, but you also get all the, the imperfections and stuff as well. So it's all a very interesting experiment. Very, very interesting. So you've got this part, people ask me the same question, how, how much stuff do you get out of a 3D print? 
So out of one kilogram, this gentleman up here who's showing name faceless, because that's how he took the photo, um, created 392 chess pieces out of one, kilo, one, um, one uh, kilo of material. So it's, um, you know, it gives you an idea of, of the, uh, the amount you can make. I'm sure he had a very, very low infill, very low infill. So, you know, it's kind of a very interesting thing. Um, cool. So, like, what can you make? What, what do people make uh, with these 3D printers? I, I kind of went online today and I, I found some examples that I wanted to show you. Some are really cool, some are really kind of out there. Uh, the first one up the top left is a cover for the iPhone. So, you know, you go out and you buy a cover to protect your iPhone. Here's someone who's actually created some really intricate designs. And again, if you wanted to create this in a traditional uh, manner, if you, if you wanted to do this out of plastic, you'd have to go and actually machine tool uh, the die. Or if you had a piece of material, you'd actually have to go and remove all that material, where the 3D printer puts that in uh, quite easily. Going right across, uh, you've got on the right hand, top right hand side, um, you've got a young lady playing a futuristic violin that actually works. And that's a 3D printed design that actually is a, is a, is a very interesting musical instrument. Um, going down, you've got a guitar, which uh, the main body is again 3D printed, and you can see um, the selectiveness of that design. Um, and going right across, you have a what they call a retro pie, which is a Game Boy um, based on a Raspberry Pi computer. So, you know, it used to be that you would make the circuit and put it into a plastic container that came out of Dick Smith, which doesn't exist anymore either way, right? so you wouldn't be able to do that. Now you're actually able, with a 3D printer, to design the housing itself. So why put it into a zippy box? Why not put it into a robot? Or why not put it into a, a you know, a, a, a box that looks like a Game Boy? And you've got that flexibility now, which is pretty amazing. And in the middle of it, we've actually got a geared heart, which actually moves. So are people selling these digital files? Can you some people sell them, some people uh, share them freely. So you can, you know, if you're interested in, in replicating what they've created, you can take it to your 3D printer. Okay. There, are, there are places where people will ask you for a charge. They've invested time and effort. And, and there are other people out there who become like digital scribes where you can hire them to make designs for you. I've seen a few of those sort of things. But what I wanted to show you next is really one of the reasons why I work at the library here and I teach the classes that I do, and it's a thing called Virgo Hand. So the gentleman up in the yellow t-shirt up there, um, he's a South African uh, woodworker, uh, a, a carpenter, and unfortunately he accidentally cut four, the tops of the four of his fingers off, and he was rushed to a hospital, and they said to him, uh, well basically he said to the doctor, can you, can you save my fingers? And unfortunately the way he lost them, they, they, they weren't able to uh, put them back on. So he said, look, look there's no problem. Um, he had already decided because he works with his hands and it's very much the way he identifies with himself that he would get prosthetic fingers. So he asked them to make an appointment at the hospital. Um, when he went to, um, to he waited the time, he went to see the prosthesis uh, doctor. They said, no problems, we can replace your fingers. It's $40,000, $10,000 per finger. He said, hang on, I said, I don't have $40,000 to invest in prosthetic fingers. And I said, that's the cost. That's actually the cost to, to get a prosthetic um, uh, replacement. Which, uh, when you think about it, is like, wow. Like, you know, to imagine. It's not something that's really covered by uh, public health in South Africa. And to be honest with you, I don't even know if it's covered here to a certain degree. Um, so he started thinking, he said, this is crazy. I make things for a living. I can design something. So he went to the internet and he started posting. And he said, does anyone got any experience in making prosthetic hands, prosthetic limbs in some way or another? Um, and he actually got in touch with someone in Seattle in the US who was a theater uh, prop maker. And he said, look, I, I did a show where we created these kind of prosthetic hands using a very basic design. Um, and the design is really, I've actually got the piece here. And the design looks like this. There are, the, unfortunately, the, the band's broken here, but the fingers are actually attached um, to this piece. And you can see it, these bands on, on the little boy's hand, um, they're just uh, elastic bands, basically. And the idea is that, if I use my hand, that if it's, if it's, um, if it's attached to my wrist and I move it down, it puts tension onto those bands that close the fingers. So the idea is that I'm holding it open like this, and as I go like this, it closes them, opens, closes, opens. 
which is actually kind of mimicking the way our uh, tendons work, except the difference is we're actually sending an impulse that opens and closes the tendons, but if they were actually, um, if, they couldn't, if they were elastic, the more you stretched out, and if you ever do it yourself, if you, if you try to hold your fingers and, and move your hand down, you feel the tension on your tendons. That's why naturally when we, when we do this, we, we kind of relax our fingers. It's very hard to keep them open. So using that principle, which is just basically a, a lever, um, they designed this hand called Robo Hand. Um, the irony with, uh, with um, Richard Van Eyes, who's the guy there, um, was that he still had parts of his fingers left. And you can see him in the photo, he's actually hold, using the nubs of his fingers to hold the screwdriver. Uh, and he couldn't use the hand. So but, um, they developed this, they, you know, when they were actually talking about and developing it, they said, how are we going to work on this? You're in, in, in America, I'm in South Africa. They decided they would buy a 3D printer each, the same 3D printer. And what they would do is they would work on it during the day and send it to the other guy. And while one of them was sleeping, the other one would work on it and they would print out designs and, and they actually troubleshooted it to, to make this design work. Great working, unfortunately, uh, Richard couldn't, um, Use it, but people were so amazed at, at, at the process that they were using that uh, a reporter came, did a, a story in the local paper, and uh, this young lady here with her son had heard about it and realized that her son, who was born with a, a thing called amniotic band syndrome, which means that children are born without fingers, but they have the palm of their hands, she basically realized that this could help her son. And you can imagine if it's $40,000 for four fingers, what would it be for a child? It's well out of the cost of most parents. Also, the prosthetic industry doesn't want to make prosthetics for children because they tend to be rough and they grow fast. So her son here is about, uh, I think it's about 12, 13. How many hands over the next five years would he have to go through as his body's growing? I have a friend of mine, a family, uh, family friend. Um, she was born with, uh, she had a, uh, an issue that severed her, her spine when she was born. She can't feel anything from her waist down. Um, she's 16 right now, and she's been, she's like a bodybuilder. She has such upper body strength because at the age of 24, they can give her a thing called a rewalker, which is a, a frame that will actually be able, she'll be able to walk around. But as a child, she had to start training to be able to use this machine, which is kind of crazy. Like, you know, she actually is a, a testament to, to, to upper body strength because she's sitting there lifting weights for the day that she'll be able to stand on her own and be able to hold her own body weight, right? So why can't we take this process and just make the frame for her now, right? Because this hand cost us $30 out of materials and, and nuts and bolts. So we've got, let's say, $50,000 to 30. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'd see things constructed that have got two nuts working parts and articulated and hinged parts. Mm -hmm. Are they assembled or can the printer somehow fit internal? So the beautiful thing is, in this case, they're all separate pieces that you put together. Um, there are the, uh, prints out here that are actually made with enough material missing that when you take them off the bed, they're already hinged. Now, as it depends on, <laughs> really, it's all about technique and design. So I haven't seen anything that, that's moved on from that, but there are, the, those, that foundation has already been developed. So it's definitely a case here. So going back here with the roller hand, one of the things I did was they shared these designs online. They said, if anyone needs this sort of design, please, you know, if you've got access to a 3D printer, make it happen, change the world. And this is like something that really kind of amazingly kind of grew. Um, the first top photo is a gentleman in South Africa. Uh, so, yeah, so, sorry, in Africa, not South Africa. Um, and he lost a hand in, a, in, a, in like a, a tribal war, and there's some people who go around with 3D printers and as much film as they can put in the backpack called the Adam Project, and they go around providing like artificial limbs to people who just, you know, it's a struggle to get raw clean water and, and medical attention. So this, this sort of thing would be right out of, out of the league. And you can see down below the, there's two patients out of that project who are kind of fist bumping with um, with replacement limbs. Um, go down further and you can see people are playing on that, developing that idea a little bit further, making these things a little chunky and a little bit more human. Um, right at the top here, they've actually designed a hand, again, same idea, same concept, that's a lot more human-like, which is really kind of cool. And then you've got a young gentleman here who actually has lost a lot more than just his uh, fingers. He's actually lost his arm. You can see the photo there. Um, and 
this, uh, this man here has actually made a cup and hand using PVC pipe as the forearm, a very cheap answer, and it's actually form fitted to, to uh, the little boy there. So I mean, like, this is the potential. Everyone thought, wow, great, no problems. Like, look at what's going on. Um, and that's where the project sat for a long time until this happened. Just gonna go down here. We're looking for nine one two. Hey Alex, how are you? Pleasure to meet you. I have another bionics expert on hand, so I thought I'd drop by. Thank you. Yes, yeah, a pleasure. Nice bow tie, by the way. Thanks. How were your travels? It's very good. Well, I thought I'd bring uh, one of my gauntlets and match it up with yours and uh, see if everything's copacetic. You want to have a look? Sure. Ready? Yep. Great. Each one looks the same. Actually, I think yours might be better than mine. What do you say we, uh, we both try them on, do a progress report? OK. You know who that is? Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> What's his name? Robert. Great. God, dude, it's even cooler than I thought. <clears throat> I'm having a technical glitch. Um, as you can see, my light isn't working. Half the time, you know, I design one of these, it winds up breaking on me. But what I do is I keep working on it, kind of like you're working on it with Albert. He keeps working and working until he gets it right. Yeah. I think yours is still a little bit more right than mine because at least, you know. The lights work. Your light works, yeah. Ah, oh, look at that, Dan. It's a marriage of robotic technologies. Bang, nailed it. Love it. Hey, good job, Albert. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Appreciate it. Albert has made it so affordable. I'm probably gonna start farming out a lot of my tech work to Albert too. I feel like he could cut the price point down on one of my suits, which right now is, I guess, about, I don't know, a billion and a half dollars. Um, for those of you who don't know, Robert Downing Jr. played a character called Tony Stark, who created a robotic suit of armor. And um, Albert, the guy who was talking about, took those designs, those hand designs, and decided he wanted to take it to the next level. But not just take it to the next level, he kind of realized, you know, when you're a kid in school and you're different, kids don't have a filter. They can be kind of really brutal. So if you're gonna give a child some sort of prosthetic device that looks different, why do you have to look weird? Why can't it be super cool? Why can't it be a superhero? So that's exactly what he did. He was able to create this, this hand, which, as you could hear, actually had silver motors embedded in, 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 in them, and actually worked off uh, biofeedback um, to actually open and close that arm. So no longer is it just a simple mechanism opening and closing, you've actually got an electronic biofeedback, almost kind of like a bionic hand in the, in the same vein as, as Iron Man. And that obviously got the attention of, of Robert Downey Jr. who wanted to come out and kind of, you know, kind of spruik what was going on. And was, this was kind of really cool. And and, you know, I always thought to myself, going, well, wow, you know, when, when they get that working, he walks into school, it's, it's going to be a, a pretty amazing uh, opportunity. Um, and really, no one ever thought about it. Like, you know, it's cool. Um, all this stuff came out of materials that were readily available. It wasn't, you know, no computer company or, or robotic company got involved. It was all based on kind of Arduino technology, writing very simple code and being able to, to judge certain things. And everyone, as I said, thought about it, didn't really think too much uh, more of it. And then this hit the, hit the internet. And this kind of was like the potential of all this technology. Disney um, started a accelerator program. And one of the things that they kind of ticked off to develop was prosthetic limbs for kids using their, their brands, such as Marvel with the Iron Man, Frozen, I believe that's Elsa's hand, and Star Wars. And I, I kind of looked back and said to myself, hang on a second, Disney is an entertainment in company. Why would they ever be interested in getting into a, a medical field? And the power of that was the prototyping's already done. 
See, it's a win-win for Disney. It's a win-win for the people who, children who are in this situation. $10,000, let's say a whole hand arm, something like that, let's say 50, conservatively. Well, Disney can, can make these things and, and put them out in the market for 1000 And at 1000 you can buy that for a child who needs one. But $50,000, that's another question. So this is really the power of 3D printing, the prototyping, the testing, going through all those different uh, designs, iterations, and all the rest of it. It's not the same person doing each one. Someone comes and contributes to the project and then passes it on to someone else who has another spin and another idea. Um, I saw this and I was like, wow. Like, I mean, this is the potential. You know, everyone keeps talking about 3D printing. Is it going to go down a gurgle? Is it not? For the people who actually understand this is a tool, this is what can happen. You can actually enroll a company, the world's biggest media company, to take a chance and go into a f medical field that's already established. And by the way, the people with the prosthesis guys, they have no idea how to deal with this because they know how to, you know, turn metal and make each one individual and build for the hours, right? With 3D printing technology, you can custom design each one of these for a child. I mean, it's phenomenal. This actually changes the world. Because there are people in need who actually have to, have a qu and answer a question. And this is just one example. There are thousands. Things are going on right now with people who are able to use these machines sitting on desks and actually empower their ideas to be able to go and create. And I think that's the power of home manufacturing. I don't have to go and have a lathe and a mill and a plastic inject molding machine. Well, I need some time, some ingenuity, and the ability to just keep building on ideas. Well, it's phenomenal, absolutely. So that's why I come here, and that's why I work at Live with the Doc, and that's why I speak to as many people as I can about this technology. Um, here at the, th at the library, we have a 3D printing program. We have three basic classes, um, or three classes. Uh, you guys didn't take it today, but what you did here is pretty much the 3D printing seminar. Um, I just compacted it down a little bit for you guys. Um, the next stage that we offer is uh, Design Your Own Print, which is the class I was telling you where people come in and it's an hour actually designing very simple printable objects and getting an idea of how to build upon um, what we've done and giving them the tools to be able to. And we also have a repair and print class, which if you're going to build something in SketchUp, it shows you the process to be able to get those uh, results you want out of, out of the machines. And all of these classes are free and they can, all can be booked uh, online at, if you guys are interested. Um, my, look, thank you so much for taking a listen. My name is Gil Pazdansky. I'm the creative technologies activator for the city of Melbourne. That's kind of cool. I work here at the Makerspace at Live in the Dark. Um, there's all my information. If you want to go and take a look at my website, you'll see some of the kind of creative things that I've done in the past. Um, and if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to, uh, to say that now. Oh, okay.